Hey, uh, here we are, 2015, and uh, there's still trouble. The SCOTUS ruling, June 26, 2015, legalized gay marriage. Now, before I go into this, I just want to say that any time I talk about this subject, probably 20 to 30 people are going to listen to me and never come back. The issue is that sensitive. The issue is that divisive. The issue is that volatile. And it is not an issue that I particularly want to talk about today. It's not an issue that I really want to, to, for you to enjoy your 4th of July with. It's an uncomfortable position. But I want to say that July 26th was a historical event. And how are we to respond to that? Did it change the gospel? Did it change the gospel? No. Uh, did it change scripture? No. There's a lot of things that that ruling is not going to change. But there are a lot of things that it will change. And we are caught in a, we are caught in a wedge, I'd like to say. We're caught in a wedge. Folks, the only thing that as the pastor that I can fall back to is scripture. The only place I find my answers is scripture. I go to the words of Jesus. I go to the teachings of Jesus. I go to the teachings of Paul. I go to the Old Testament. I find out the progression from Old Testament to New Testament. And I try to look at everything. I don't try to make this a one subject issue. I don't try to make it the focus. But oftentimes, that becomes our focus. And you can see the things that I wrote there in, uh, in the bulletin, if you'd like, a uh, few things. I spent probably six hours. I wrote two different documents that I was going to hand out and present to you. I elected not to. Um, this is kind of where I, I see all this. First of all, I think it's an issue of truth and grace. Truth is what we stand for. Grace is how we treat people. That hasn't changed. That was the same June 25th as it was June 26th. And the, the truth that we believe as we look at Scripture is there are certain behaviors that are sinful. Not everybody agrees with that. And one of the things that I've discovered, and uh, for some of you that, that prayed for me back in October... Um, I was part, I thank you for that, I was part of a, a panel. Uh, there were five pastors that met at the University of Indianapolis, and we shared about this, this issue. We had 15 minutes. Uh, somehow I missed, uh, missed the instructions. There was a, a beeper that went off at the 10-minute mark, which warned us we had five more minutes. And so the beep, I was first to go, and the beeper went off. And I thought that was the beeper to tell me I was done. And so I really only got 10 minutes. Everyone else got 15. But one of the things I discovered in that panel, one, I was the only one, only panelist that said that God draws a line on the behavior. And on this side is um, holiness, the gift that God gives us of sexuality is between a man and a woman in a married covenant relationship and he draws a line and says anything else outside of that is sinful whether it's between a man and a man a woman and a woman uh, two people living outside of marriage whatever it is that's the line that God draws I was the only one that drew the line there matter of fact it, I wasn't really sure where other people drew the line I got for sure that one person drew the line that this side on the sinful was gang rape. Gang rape was sinful. That's the only thing I really detected. But there was another person that, that drew the line in a different place. Basically, he drew the line that on this, on this side of the sinful side was me. Because I would discriminate against gay people. 
That was his view. So let's look at that. Let's look at the accusation against me. I have lived my life as a pastor who has tried to treat all people with love. I don't care if you're gay or lesbian or an alcoholic or black or white or red or yellow. I'm going to treat you with the same love and respect and dignity as I would anybody else. That, that, that's different than saying, this is a standard I believe in and I'm not going to behave in such a standard because I believe it's wrong. That is not being prejudiced against someone who believes differently. Extending grace to someone is to say, you believe differently than I do, but you're still a human being. God loves you, I love you, and let's live together in peace. And I'd say the same thing for someone who is a Muslim. A Muslim believes very differently than I do. A Hindu believes very differently than I do. A Buddhist believes very differently than I do. Now, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a religious issue. And I'm going to disagree with the Muslim. I'm going to disagree with the Buddhist. I'm going to disagree with the Hindu. But I'm not going to treat them with hate. June 26 didn't change that for me. June 26 for me, says, I will continue to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I will continue to love my brothers and sisters who are not in Christ. I will continue to love all people. This year, 2015, back in January, we shared our vision. We've got this green blanket. We invite you to pray, which says, rooted in Christ, Growing in grace. Rooted in the love of Christ. I as a person, as a follower of Jesus Christ, my goal is to be like Jesus. I'm a long way from that. But when I look at this, I see how Jesus treated people. Jesus met a woman at the well. She was an adulterer. She'd been married five times. He wasn't treating her any different than his own disciples. He treated her with respect. Psalm 139 says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Doesn't matter who you are. That statement is true for you. So our job is to get past our prejudices. We don't have to compromise our beliefs... We still stand for truth. We treat people with grace. Truth and grace. And why do I use those two words? Why don't I use some other words somewhere else? Because at John 1, 14, 15, and 16, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus was full of Truth and grace. There is no tension in Jesus between truth and grace. But for us, we feel tension between standing for truth and treating people with grace. Rooted in Christ from Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 rooted in the love of Christ, is specifically what Paul prays for. That's in the book of Ephesus, the measure of love. How high, how deep, how long, and how wide. Growing in grace. Well, I did all that without my PowerPoint, so let's just, uh, let's just wrap up here. Uh, United Methodist Church says this, all people are loved by God and have sacred worth. June 26 didn't change what the United Methodist Church says about marriage. Marriage is defined as a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. June 26 didn't change how I conduct myself as a pastor of the United Methodist Church. I am not to conduct same-sex unions, and no same-sex unions are to be conducted on this property. 
Some would see that as discriminatory. We see that as this is what we believe, but we will treat you with love and grace for what you believe, but we're not going to believe that. Now, also, in this congregation, there are folks that would disagree with me. And I want to say, I extend grace to you, that you might disagree with me on everything, anything that I've said about this particular subject. I would just say, you know, please, stay rooted in Christ, grow in grace, go to your scripture, share with me what you think. Your belief is, I had four other pastors that disagreed with me back in October. Full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And then John 15, 16, Jesus says, pray in the name of Jesus. Pray in the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean try to get your way by using Jesus' name. That means try to discover what the will of God is. Try to discover what the will of God is. Seek God's will. And when you pray in the name of Jesus, Jesus is a name above all other names. In Ephesus, they saw, non-Christians saw, Jesus, saw Paul pray in the name of Jesus and people were healed. And they tried to use that same thing. They tried to heal people with the name of Jesus. And uh, the scenario, the demon said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, we don't know who you are, and the demons attack the people using the name of Jesus. I find that hilarious. But also find it as a warning. Praying in the name of Jesus is not the way, is not a, a method to try to get your way or try to use power outside of Jesus' name. And so, here we are, July 5th, 2015, post SCOTUS ruling. And what is our response? Our response is to pray. Pray for our nation. Pray for our churches. Pray for our people. You know, I've got, I've got a lot of people that's been upset with me over the years because I don't preach enough about the sin out there. And my response to those people are always this. Please share your sin with me so I can preach about that. They don't like to hear it. I say the same thing for all of us. When we get so focused on their sin, we lose track of what Jesus wants us to do, and that is to purge our spirits of sin, to purge ourselves of sin. We are the ones, you, you don't have control over anybody else, you are the one that God has said he wants you to be like his son Jesus Christ, in spirit, in grace, in truth. So let's pray that God would transform us and that we would transform the world. Join me in prayer. Most holy God, we, uh, we come to you this morning and we just ask you to, um, to heal our land. We repent today of the sins in our lives. And Lord, help us to stand for truth, but help us to be full of grace. Lord, help us to reach out to our brothers and sisters who disagree with us. Help us to be welcoming and loving and kind and generous. And forgive us, O oh God. Forgive us when we've been hateful. Forgive us when we have spewed hatred with our mouths and with our Facebook posts with our emails and help us to grow deeper in love with you and help us display the love of Christ in Jesus name Amen